Here are five deadly rust anti-patterns you should avoid. We'll start with the straightforward ones and then slowly introduce the more nuanced mistakes. The first rust anti-pattern is lazy man error handling. Rust's resultinum is a powerful tool for error management, representing either the success case with the OK variant or the error case with the error variant. By using the resultinum as the return type, callers of the function are forced to explicitly check if the OK variant is returned, indicating a successful operation, or the error variant is returned, indicating a failed operation. But developers often get around this explicit checking by resorting to shortcuts. For example, calling the unwrap method on the result enum. This method simply returns the value inside the OK variant in the success case, but panics in the failure case, immediately terminating the program. So by using this method, you're basically saying, I expect the result to be the OK variant, and if it's not, kill the entire program instead of dealing with the error. A slightly more useful version of this is the expect method, which does the same thing but allows you to provide a custom panic message so you can at least provide some context. Now another shortcut developers resort to is ignoring the returned result enum. This is especially true for functions that only provide a useful value in the failure case. When calling this function to write to a file, callers just need to know if the operation succeeded. So a unit type is used in the success case. In the failure case, an actual error type is provided that gives callers more information about the failure. When calling these types of functions, developers sometimes opt to ignore the returned result enum entirely, assuming the operation succeeded. But this means if an error did occur, it would silently be discarded. The last error handling shortcut developers use is calling the panic macro to immediately terminate the program when an error occurs instead of gracefully handling the error. Now, while these error handling shortcuts speed up development by avoiding proper error handling logic, they also lead to brittle code because errors aren't properly handled, which can cause unexpected crashes in production. This is why it's so important to implement proper error handling once your code has passed the initial rapid prototyping stage. And a great way to enforce proper error handling is by using Rust's built-in linter. By adding the following lint rules to the top of your main.rs or lib.rs file, You'll get compile time errors if you call the unwrap or expect methods, use the panic macro, or ignore the result enum. This will force you and developers working on the same code base to use proper error handling practices. The second anti-pattern is neglecting standard library traits. Let's go through a few useful ones. The default trait allows you to provide useful default values for your types. In this example, we have a struct called player. Instead of manually initializing level, items, and special power every time we construct a new player instance, let's implement the default trait. In this case, we can simply derive the default trait because all of the structs fields also implement default. Now we're able to construct new player instances by calling the default associated function. Another useful set of traits is from and try from. These traits allow you to convert between types and are especially useful for converting between errors. The only difference between these traits is that try from is used for conversions that can potentially fail, while from is used for conversions that must not fail. In this example, we've defined a custom error type called CLI error. It has two variants, IO error and parse error. Then we can implement the from trait twice, one implementation to convert an IO error to a CLI error, and another to convert a parse int error into a CLI error. Finally, we'll define a function called open and parse file and use the question mark operator to convert and propagate errors with ease. Another useful trait is from str. This trait allows you to parse user-defined types from a string. For example, here we have a struct called point. By implementing the from str trait, we can write code which parses a given string into a point instance, or fail if the string is malformed. In this case, we're specifying that the string should have coordinates defined inside parentheses separated by a comma. Then we're able to create new point instances from strings. This is especially useful when parsing string data from files. By the way, if you're interested in becoming a professional Rust developer, I've just created a brand new free Rust training, but more on that later. The third Rust anti-pattern is cloning everywhere, which degrades performance by increasing memory usage and slowing down your application. Let's explore some common cloning scenarios and how to avoid them. The first common scenario is cloning struct fields in getter methods. Here we have a simple getter method that tries to return a field from a struct. Many developers write it this way at first, by returning the field directly. Seems reasonable, right? But the Rust compiler won't let us do this and throws an error. 
Why? Because we only have temporary access to the user instance through a shared reference to self. So we can't just give away values that the user instance owns. The compiler will suggest cloning the struct fields if the performance cost is acceptable. And while following the suggestion fixes the compile time error, it also introduces performance overhead since every call to the settings method will create a new memory allocation. Instead, we can simply return a reference to the settings field. This lets callers decide whether they just need to read the value or if they actually need to clone it. So here's a rule of thumb. Return references from getter methods unless you have a specific reason to return owned values. The second common scenario is cloning in the constructor functions. At first glance, it might seem more flexible to accept references as constructor arguments. After all, why force callers to give up ownership of their values, right? However, since our struct needs to store owned values, we're introducing unnecessary clones every time a new user object is created. Instead, if your struct stores owned values in its fields, then the constructor function should take owned values as parameters. This way, callers can decide for themselves if they can transfer ownership of the values or if cloning is necessary. The third scenario is cloning data that needs to be shared. Let's say you have multiple threads that work with the same data. You might be tempted to just clone the data for each thread, but this has two big problems. First, you're creating new memory allocations, obviously. And second, the threads can't work with the same data anymore because each thread has its own separate copy. The solution is to use ARC, a smart pointer designed exactly for this purpose. ARC, which stands for Atomic Reference Counting, allows you to share ownership of a single piece of data across multiple threads. When you clone an ARC, you're just incrementing the reference counter, which is very cheap. The catch is, ARC only lets threads read the data, not modify it. If you do need the ability to modify the shared data, you can combine ARC with a synchronization smart pointer like read-write-lock. This smart pointer ensures that threads take turns making changes safely. In summary, cloning isn't something terrible that you should never use, but it should be a conscious choice, not just a quick fix. So before reaching for clone, ask yourself, can I take ownership instead? Would a reference work here? Or do I need shared ownership through smart pointers like ARC? Only use clone when you have a specific reason to create a new copy. The fourth Rust anti-pattern is underutilizing Rust pattern matching capabilities, which leads to error-prone code that fights against Rust type system. In this example, we're accepting an optional user instance, and we have to do a couple of checks before we're able to print out the user's name. Besides these checks, we're also calling unwrap, which should be avoided if you recall the first anti-pattern we talked about. Instead, by using the match keyword, we're able to simplify this code and make it a lot cleaner. The match keyword allows us to match the optional user type against a set of patterns that execute different code depending on which pattern it matches. Notice that match statements also provide powerful features like argument deconstruction, match guards which allow us to add conditions to the match arm, and exhaustive pattern matching, meaning that all possible patterns must be covered. If we don't handle all possible cases, the compiler will actually throw an error. This is why pattern matching leads to more robust code. You can also use the match keyword to create expressions that return a value. And if you're returning a Boolean expression, you can also simplify the code further by using the matches macro from the standard library. Rust also has another form of pattern matching. Instead of doing normal if checks, for example, checking that a vector is not empty before pulling out the first element, we can use the if let syntax, which allows us to pattern match against the vector and pull out the first element at the same time. In general, pattern matching is a powerful feature which leads to concise and robust code, so make sure to take advantage of it. The fifth anti-pattern you should avoid is glob imports, otherwise known as wildcard imports. Wildcard imports are generally considered bad practice in most languages because of reduced code readability and the potential for naming conflicts. But in Rust, there are some specific, subtle ways wildcard imports can break your code. And ironically, there are actually some cases where wildcard imports are encouraged. First, let's talk about how wildcard imports can break your code. Let's say you're importing a bunch of individual traits, types, functions, and other items from a third-party library. You might be tempted to use a wildcard import to import every public symbol from a given module. This makes your code more concise, but there are a couple of problems wildcard imports introduce. The first problem is wildcard imports can break your code when you update dependencies, even if the update is considered non-breaking. 
Rust crates use semantic versioning, meaning breaking changes should only be introduced in major version bumps. However, exporting new symbols from a library is not considered a breaking change. So let's say one of your dependencies introduces a new public trait in a minor version update, and it implements it for some type. If any function signatures from that new trait clash with existing function signatures that apply to that type, then the compiler won't be able to figure out which function is intended and will throw a compile time error. Now there's another way wildcard imports can subtly break your code. And I'll admit it's very edge case, but also very interesting, so I want to cover it. Imagine you're using an enum from a third-party library. In this case, the custom error enum, which has three variants. Then you upgrade the major version of that library in which the enum variants change. Specifically, one of the variants is removed. You might expect your code to break, but it actually still compiles. Except when you run your code, you'll get an unexpected result. So what's going on here? Well, because parse error is no longer a variant, it's actually treated as a variable name. This match arm will actually match any pattern and store the matched value in the parse error variable. This means if the first arm isn't matched, the second arm will always match, and we will never reach the third arm. Now, we will get a couple compiler warnings saying that the last arm is unreachable and that parse error should be converted to snake case because it's a variable name. But the point is, your code will compile and it will produce unexpected results. The solution is pretty straightforward. Import the enum variants explicitly. This way, you'll get a compile time error when one of the variants is removed. Alternatively, if there are a lot of items that need to be imported, you can simply import the module, or in this case the enum, rename it using the as keyword for conciseness, and then use that name as a prefix before specifying any sub-items. Although wildcard imports are generally considered bad practice, there are a few cases in Rust where they make sense. And you'll see these cases pretty often. The first case is prelude imports. Preludes include a small set of fundamental traits and types that are commonly needed and carefully chosen by library authors. The second case is unit test modules. Tests need access to all items they're testing from the parent module. And the third case is re-exports. When a module exists purely to collect and re-export items, wildcards are acceptable because exposing these items is the module's only job. The sixth Rust anti-pattern and the biggest sin of them all is not getting help with your Rust journey. So if you want to become a professional Rust developer, I've got some great news. I just created a brand new free Rust training, which you can get at letsgetrusty.com slash training. In this training, we'll cover topics like the five deadly mistakes preventing you from getting your first Rust job, the fastest way to gain Rust competency based on my experience working with thousands of students, and how to use this simple three-step hack to get your dream Rust job in an industry of your choosing. So click the link in the pinned comment below to get your free Rust training today.